The original premise of the coalition really sort of bordered on the audacious. The notion of civil society and representatives of governments sitting together around the same table, all at an equal level, speaking their minds. The notion of individual representatives of industry and, 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 and the business community getting together and putting their institutional hats at the door to get down to business. Um, it sounds pretty audacious, but that was really how we began. There was no model, there was no plan to move forward. We had to make it up as we, as we went along. And today we look back over an intrepid, sort of triumphant decade. And I share these memories, Jagdish, with my co-moderator here and partner in crime, Jagdish Upadhyay who's chief of the Commodity Security Branch at UNFPA. <laughs> Jagdish was the key person actually responsible for putting all the coalition chairs through their paces. For those of you who don't know, Jagdish is the chair of the nomination committee within the executive committee. So not only does he <laughs> review the candidates, he grills them, and then eventually puts them forward for nomination to the executive committee. In fact, he interviewed me for my job. So everyone you'll be seeing up here in the next hour or so uh, are the result of, of his work. Uh, together with Jagdish, I'd like to present some of the, the key characters in the coalition story. And I'd like to ask them to come up one by one in order of appearance. Uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Lule, if you could please join us. I've known Elizabeth since the 1990s, early 1990s, when she was with Pathfinder in Nairobi and, and I was with the Pop Council. Um, Elizabeth has had to date uh, an illustrious career, just finishing overseeing the development of the family planning strategy of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Elizabeth was our first chair, um, serving from 2004 to 2006. Uh, and we will call her, during the course of this session, the pioneer, staking the claim and carving out a space and position for the coalition. The next person I'd like to call up is Margaret Verveek. Margaret's a senior evaluator at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs <laughs> of the Netherlands. Margaret served as co-chair from 2006 to 2008. And when I think of the role that she played, I call Margaret the builder, because she helped get our house into order and get it down to business. Up until the end of 2012, Wolfgang Bichmann headed the Health, Education, and Social Protection Division uh, at KFW, German Development Bank. He chaired, he chaired the coalition from 2006 with Margaret, and then through 2009. Wolfgang, you'll soon find out, was the provider, managing the coffers and making our money work smartly. Julia. Julia leads the technical and programmatic division of IPPF's global efforts. She chaired the coalition from 2009 to 2013. And as you'll hear later, Julia was very much the alchemist, concocting new partnerships and strategies never tried before with amazingly gainful results. Now, all of you know Margaret, uh, Marlene Temmerman as our current chair. She is the director of the Department of Reproductive Health and Research at WHO. And when Marlene joined us last year, the reproductive field had really become, as I've said many times during the course of these last two days, a far more complex scene than it was 10 years ago. So as we make this transition into the next decade, with a renewed mandate, we look to Marlene to be our navigator into the future. So why don't we take our seats, Jagdish, and I have a question for you. Oh my um, I've always said that all of our chairs have been as different as day and night and yet each one has been absolutely perfect for that moment. When you interview the chairs, what are you looking for? What are you looking for in candidates? Please, take a seat. John. 
I, I, I must say this. Whatever I was looking for it, I got the best. <laughs> 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 but before I answer your question, I would like to give my tribute to one person that is no more with us, Terry Barlett. Um, we miss her because she was the movement before we started coalition. Another person who is here actually, who also helped us to bring this coalition what it is, is, is uh, Musunguzi, Thomas Musunguzi. Can you stand up? He was, he was very supportive. Now, John, coming back to your question. Yes, please. You ask a very simple question, so I have to answer very simple words. I don't know if it is a simple question. You know, the work that we do <clears throat> is not our job. It's our passion. It's here in the heart. So what we look for it is all these people where the supplies is not their job. Supply is their pa passion. And you can see every era that we went through, they work for supplies, they work for family planning, they work for commodity security, as the passion to talk about it. So that was the first criteria who can, who can talk about supplies as the most essential thing to take the movement further. The second was, you know, we have a different partnership. It's a coalition, it's not a partnership, it's not the structure. We don't have a legal entity or anything. What we need to bring is bring people together. So what we, what we were looking at that time is those people who can bring people together from different agenda, from different organizations, from different institutions, and talk one common agenda. And these leaders have that competencies. And third, which is much simpler, is to have a helicopter view. Because sometimes we look at the, our, 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 our own organization and our own agenda and think that what we are doing is probably the best thing in the world. But we do not see where the world is moving and how best we can th bring things together and take this movement. Because at the time when we started coalition, supplies were the most forgotten thing at that point of time. I will come to other competency as we continue discussing about each chair. So back okay. to you, John. Good, good. Well, when we take this helicopter view, <laughs> it also kind of brings us back to the origins um, of the coalition. And I remember maybe last year, um, Elizabeth and I bumped into each other in the hallway uh, when I was visiting uh, the Gates Foundation, and we were sort of talking about the early days of, of the coalition. And I remember, Elizabeth, you kind of sighing and saying, oh, yeah, that was a long, difficult birth. Um, tell us about that long, difficult birth, if you can bear it. Uh, what were the challenges in getting the coalition started? And why did you stick to it? Um, thank you, John. Um, <laughs> as you said in your opening remarks, we were really building a plane as we were flying it. There was no blueprint. There was no uh, examples that we could look at. And it was a long pregnancy, <laughs> 24 months, uh, let alone the labor of uh, delivering the um, child at the end of the day. Thank God you don't go through labor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was, um, it was difficult but exhilarating. Just like when you deliver a baby, you, you forget about all the pains. And this is exactly how I feel. Uh, being here, I just would like to congratulate all of you for the work that you have done, for building the coalition, for growing it. Each person in this room, in so many ways, has made huge contributions to make us where we are today. And it was a difficult journey. When we first started, there was a group of... Um, there was an interim working group that had emerged out of the Istanbul conference. And you mentioned Terry Bartlett, but I'd like to remember my very good friend, Amy Cohen, mm. at that time, who was also leading uh, the um, PAI at that time. Um, Jane Hutchings, um, Caroline Hart, who is not here, and so many others. Um, and Susan Rich Susan. was also one of them. They were so passionate. and I. They used to invite me to their meetings, to dinners, and I was wondering why they were, so, they were being so friendly. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Little did I know that they were 
uh, actually <laughs> trying to coerce me into taking on this um, incredible challenge of um, trying to establish the coalition. And it all started in the, um, at the World Bank. We actually had the meeting at IFC, which is a private sector wing. I hope that is quite significant because the private sector involvement was quite a contentious issue throughout the life of the coalition, and I'm glad Margaret and others um, set that up. But it was a difficult period. If those of you um, who are around then, you may recall that actually access to um, uh, universal access to reproductive health had been omitted from the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, the global AIDS architecture for global health was very complicated. It was also at the time the uh, Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and uh, uh, Malaria was being established. In fact, we counted how many partnerships existed in global health. There were 170 mm -hmm. partnerships. And there was also an allergy to having yet another uh, partnership. And we decided we would work around this and perhaps a coalition was the best way. It was a community of practice. It would allow us to um, share uh, and face the challenges and work towards actually getting the supplies out there. Um, the supplies area itself was a big mess. <coughs> I don't know how many of you remember the JSI wire diagram on Kenya showing how many um, vertical uh, programs they were and each one of them was actually bringing in contraceptives or maternal health commodities and nobody knew who the other one was doing so the complications were at the global level even worse at the country level um, so it was you know everybody believed that we needed to do this and that's where the coalition came from um, i did this for 24 um, months and i moved on once i took another job at the world bank I didn't realize this was going to be a, a second job. <laughs> it actually took over all my life, and I still had to deliver on my World Bank job. And there was no secretariat before you came. Um, the secretariat was actually two people. Jane Hutchings, if you are in the room, please stand up. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Another uh, young woman, Sangeeta Raja, I think most of you who work in the supplies area. And I didn't have any staff, so actually USAID provided the first second E to the World Bank. Um, and she's still there, and she actually was very much part of this. And I couldn't have done it alone. Mm. Um, and I had a mo an, uh, an amazing first executive committee. They were the most passionate people, most outspoken, <laughs> and our meetings were usually very fiery. Sometimes I had to stop the meetings and say, let's have coffee, we'll come back. Uh, but we were so passionate and cared. It was an experiment we didn't know that would work, and we had to build the trust, have the flexibility, and the neutrality, so that if I went in the room, I wasn't a World Bank executive, or Thuraya or Bayed, who played an extremely important role in peacemaking <laughs> between the executive committee members. She was remarkable behind the scenes and through my dear friend here, Jack Dish. Uh, but out of that um, came the secretariat. I think they were major achievements during this time. One was working with WHO to get contraceptives in the, rip, in the um, essential it. list, which, and then they helped to have that at the country level. Uh, <coughs> the second one was the pre-qualification mm -hmm. of contraceptives. And there are so many other uh, achievements that I don't need to go into. And of course, the happiest moment was when I handed over <laughs> 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 to the next um, two chairs, uh, mm. Wolfgang and Margaret, and they were able to take the foundations, the terms of reference, and they were wordsmithed to death. I mean, I don't know how many times we discussed each section, and I'm sure you've gone through the same thing, so you know what I mean. 
but they've done a great job, and indeed they were the builders. And then John uh, was identified, and we actually got funding from the Gates Foundation. The Seattle meeting was the most difficult, mm. but I think it all worked out. We got the funding, we got you, we, um, we agreed on Brussels, and life started um, to actually implement the program. And the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, you said two things that I want to pick up on. One is the, uh, the fact of how much time it takes for the chairs to do their work. Apparently this is two days a year. Yeah, this is an inside, <laughs> this is an inside joke. Uh, and I think part of Jagdish's bag of tricks when he interviews uh, potential chairs. Uh, but anyway, we'll get to that in a little bit. But speaking of foundation stones, Margaret, uh, you were there uh, at the beginning when we started the rest of history. What were the foundation stones that we needed to put into place all those years well, back? Well, the Seattle meeting was my first, very first meeting. Um, and I thought, huh, that's a challenge. <laughs> um, foundation stones. When I think of foundation stones, I also think of the image of a <laughs> tiny turtle, you know, um, facing number of challenges, a <coughs> number of surprises as well before it really gets into the ocean. Um, now, I, I didn't bring my construction head as a builder, um, but many of, of us were basically bureaucrats. We were working in big bureaucracies. Um, and bureaucracy is not always a bad thing. So <laughs> the first thing we thought of was like, okay, we need structures. We really need structures. We need to think of structures. Um, so we looked at the composition of the executive committee. Um, already in those days, we were discussing representation from country level, for example. On the other hand, besides having a bureaucratic tendency, we were also activists. I mean, you have to be an activist yeah. in order to join a coalition or a group of people with such important commitment. So being an activist as well, came the strategic action plan. That's why it was called an action plan, John, and not a strategy. <laughs> um, so that was another <coughs> key building stone. Uh, membership was another issue. Uh, people send us papers. We would like to become members. <coughs> and honestly, we didn't know how to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. So there we were. Well, actually, Put on the spot. yeah, Jagdish, speaking of membership, um, when the membership policy was put into place, it shook a lot of people up. Um, and I remember, I remember at the time uh, there were accusations of us, and, and keep in mind, in, in these days we're talking about a membership of, of 16. And it wasn't just because there weren't more than 16 people who wanted to join, the rules at that time was that there were 16 original members. So the decision to open up was a decision that created quite a bit of debate, and there were a lot of people who accused us of sleeping with the enemy, potentially. Uh, Jagdish, you were involved in that. You were in the midst of a lot of these discussions. What, what, what were some of the issues? I was sleeping with the enemy, actually. <laughs> 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 um, it, 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 was, uh, it was really sweating those days to bring what you are here. I mean, total market. It has to be private sector. It has to be NGO sector. It has to be the government sector. It cannot confine to a club of 16 people. And that was, now on the hindsight, it looks so good that everybody's here. But that time we had a struggle because people were accusing us that it is going beyond and will not be able to communicate. We cannot make decision and all that. So it, we said the train has already left. Look at the lack region. Look at this region where civil society has done such a great job. And can we say supplies without civil society? Can we say family planning without civil society? It is impossible. So we put that argument and somehow we convince both not to only bring them in the membership, but also to some of your experience and expertise to our executive committee to have an open seat so that we can bring expertise from private sector so that we can participate with you. That was the biggest victory we could have it. John, back to you. Yeah, no, and, and it's amazing. We do keep a, 
sort of graph in the office of the growth in membership. And since that, that day in early 2007, when we changed the policy, yeah. really the increase in members within the coalition has been continuous. And in fact, has actually seen an upturn. We haven't even approached anything nearing a plateau, which is, I think, really kind of amazing. So can I come to, um, uh, we, I think we need to continue with Olbang Big Man, with your chair, and I just wanted to raise one issue, John, with uh, Mr. Bigman or Dr. Bigman. Um, at that time, and he comes from the private sector, by the way, that time the issue was, the gag rule was officially announced, and everybody was so concerned about financing thing that what will happen to family planning, what will happen to sexual reproductive health, what will happen to commodities, and that was the biggest challenge we had that time. And Dr. Bigman comes to, our, uh, to us as the chair, and you, you were so quiet, so grounded, as if nothing happened in the world. And we, you said, it's not always about more money. It is always to, have, to get the best out of our work and get, uh, what is the expression you call? Better money. Better money. More. That's the expression he gave. <coughs> Not more money, but better money. How did you do that, Dr. Wigman? Perhaps that's just a sign how tensious uh, relationships were between the private sector and the publics at that time. <coughs> because you wanted to sleep with the private sector, and you call me a private sector person. In fact, <laughs> I have been in the coalition representing the German Ministry for Development and Economic Cooperation, and uh, I worked in the German Development Bank at that time. So uh, perhaps uh, my openness to the private sector made you, as a UN representative, feel that is already the private sector. And we had not yet experienced the real private sector people. Now, uh, coming back to more or better money, you know, at that time, a big issue was the global gag rule of the US government. And um, as we, you might not really remember, but this was a very important negative thing uh, for family planning and reproductive health uh, at the time. Because the US had been forever since the 60s the major funder of family planning and reproductive health. And suddenly, a lot of funding uh, was missing at an institutions like UNFPA and the IPPF, who had had grants before and they didn't get it anymore. <coughs> so definitely more money was a big issue in the beginning. And uh, we had to bring in additional uh, donors. And uh, we looked at the European side of the Atlantic Ocean and there was U EU bilaterals who were in the field but not with enough support and there was also the EU, EU Commission who had not really uh, been uh, tapped a source which needed to be tapped. And then uh, there was a good idea uh, of the uh, Melin Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to give support to advocacy NGOs in the EU context and there was uh, creating a field of uh, support to family planning <laughs> financing. Now, having said this, in the same time, the issue was how to make more out of the money which is existing and that's what we called in the short term better money, uh, make use of innovative financing approaches and bring in um, efficiencies. That did not happen by itself. It was supported by the executive committee of the coalition. And at that time, I just mentioned there was the so-called Mercer study and later on the so-called Dahlberg study. And out of this grew an interest in the coalition to develop innovative financing mechanisms. We called them the minimum volume guarantee and the pledge guarantee for health, which if we talk about our children, you were talking about the uh, birthing process. Uh, we were raising them, and finally we could make, uh, find the 
uh, UNFPA to take over the uh, minimum volume guarantee as the so-called access for uh, access RH, and the other one, the pledge guarantee for health, was also taken up by the UN Foundation and is still existing. So you may, might have discussed it already. This was not possible without dedicated individuals, and we had a number of them uh, in the coalition. And let me start with the USAID, which had this double role. On the one hand side, they had dedicated persons who worked for reproductive health. On the other hand side, they had to uh, comply with the global gag rule. So Margaret Neuse at that time was a very important yeah. supportive <coughs> uh, person. And then in the foundation we had, uh, you already mentioned, Susan Rich, but uh, her predecessor was Jackie Derrock, who was also uh, very supportive. And I also want to remember of UNFPA's support of Toraya Obeid, because they were so open to accept that even they were the most important UN uh, organizations, there are other organizations who can uh, support us. And so IPPF, Jill Creer, Elizabeth, who is here, and a lot of collaborators in the World Bank. These were the official uh, partners, and they were amongst the 16 in the beginning. But we had to have American and European advocacy NGOs, technical agencies, and particularly the social marketing organizations at that time. And finally, we could allow the private sector representatives who had much more open view of what is innovative financing, and this has been um, continuing up to now. My last word, the facilitating forces within the coalition were the heads of the working groups, and the working groups in themselves were playing a major role uh, to make ideas grow into something concrete and uh, implementable. And last but not least, we could not have managed it without John. <laughs> we, can, we can skip over that. Let's go to Julia. <laughs> Julia, you arrived when the coalition was primed and ready to go. We had the systems in place, we were in place, we had the structures, the strategy, the terms of reference, we had a new perspective on money, thanks to the provider, and then you arrived. Now, when I think of, 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 of you and your role within the coalition, you seem to be the, the sort of the master of eureka moments. I kind of think sometimes um, it reminds me of sort of Broadway musicals. Some <laughs> minor event will take place, and then Julia bursts into song. Um, <laughs> Julia. <laughs> Uh, can you, just to give an example, I can think of a train ride that you were on together with me when we were going up to New York. It was right after the Women Deliver conference in, in Washington, D.C. Can you tell me what happened as a result of that train ride? Do you remember? I do remember. I have to be careful not to spread too many rumors. Um, <laughs> It was, as John said, a train ride that we took, having come from the Women Deliver Conference in June 2010 in Washington, uh, and we were going for a meeting at UNFPA with, with Jagdish and colleagues. And it was the time in 2010 when we knew that at the UN General Assembly later that fall, uh, the Secretary General was going to launch the Global Strategy for Women and Children's Health. And I expressed to John my concern that there was going to be nothing on reproductive health and family planning within that and said that we ought to try and mobilize our community to make sure that our issues were clearly represented within that continuum of care. And so we thought very much around the idea of the unmet need for family planning and how we could articulate to people what that need was. And what we came up with on the back of an envelope, and literally the back of an envelope on the train, was what became known as the Hand to Hand campaign, which is the commitment to enable an additional 100 million women uh, to access family planning by 2015. And actually, that was the founding uh, groundwork that then later moved on to become the London Summit for Family Planning. And there's also another sort of eureka moment I can think of, sort of unrelated, but in some respects not. Um, and that was a conversation that took place uh, with someone on a mountainside. So this one has become very much um, an urban legend. Um, <laughs> this was some work that began uh, 
in the spring of 2011, I had an email, I was at DFID at the time, and I had an email from David Smith, who at the time was the general manager for IPPF Icon, the procurement company of, I of IPPF. And he said they just had a board meeting uh, and wanted to increase access to implants, but IPPF couldn't afford to buy them, and was DFID interested in doing anything about it. And DFID had just published uh, at the end of 2010 uh, the strategy for uh, reproductive maternal and newborn health. And I'd led that process, and within that, we had a commitment to try and um, bring more products to market and to reduce the price of products. And so after the email from David, I said, well, this is something that DFID is definitely interested in, but actually it's something better that we could do within the coalition. And so I reached out to Mark Rillings uh, at USAID, I reached out to Jagdish, to colleagues at MSI, and importantly, I reached out to John. And we held a meeting in London uh, in March 2011 and agreed that there were two um, products that we were particularly interested in, Jadel and Implanon. And because of the market forces at the time, uh, around Jadel with the anticipation of Sino Implant getting pre-qualification, the decision was taken that we should focus on Implanon. And so we sat in a room and the discussion went around, what are we going to do about it? And I said, well, we can phone Frank. And so we phoned Frank, and Frank at the time was on a mountainside with his family. Oh, well, I think we had a call with you and you were just about to head off skiing. And, you said, and I said to you, hello, I'm Julia at the Coalition. We did meet once at a meeting in Kampala. Um, and you've got a great product that women need, but we can't afford to buy it. Can you reduce your price, please? Um, and he said, let's talk, which was uh, an interesting thing. He could have said absolutely not and put the phone down. But he said, let's talk. Um, and so Margaret made reference to uh, bureaucrats and, and activists. And at the time uh, at DFID, I knew this was something that was going to be really difficult for me to do within my day job. So I actually took a day's leave, I think, and, and John covered the costs of flying um, to Oss. And John and I went and spent a day with Merck in Oss, and we met with Kern and, and with other colleagues. And you made reference to sleeping with the enemy, and I remember on the journey back from, the air, uh, from Oss to the airport, Kern very kindly gave me a lift back to the airport, about a 90-minute drive, and we talked the whole way. And I said at the time that um, colleagues had been very concerned at DFID, that I was going over to the dark side in, in coming to meet with the private sector. But I think Jill made reference yesterday to the fact that actually the private sector um, has so many similarities and, and is, is committed to the cause as those of us in the public sector and civil society are. And she made reference to the meeting uh, that Katya was at when the, when the new plant was opened in Oss. And I remember at the time uh, when we arrived in Oss, that they showed us uh, a film that had been made, again for the workforce uh, in, the, in the manufacturing capacity, and it was really about changing lives. It wasn't people on a production line making widgets. It had really been made to inspire colleagues working for Merck about the benefits to the world, to global health, of the products that they were making. And I remember just sitting there being completely inspired, thinking it's the kind of film that Save the Children would make. Mm. And so when we eventually made um, what became the Implant on Access initiative and the deal was announced and it was launched um, at the uh, RHSC members meeting in Addis in the spring of 2011 and a load of work went into doing it and I know how much, I think we nearly put Frank into an early grave with all the demands we put on him uh, and I know he and Frank, uh, Frank and uh, Kern had had some really difficult meetings with senior management in Merck to get the deal announced. Um, but when we made the announcement, I'd sent a little memo round um, to my boss at DFID, who forwarded it to his boss, who forwarded it to his boss, and then it went completely viral around DFID, how this deal had been done, that it was going to generate $40 million of savings. And I was called to my director's office, um, and I had a half an hour appointment scheduled, because he wanted to know how we'd done it. And he sat down and said, so what was your strategy? What was your business case? What was the blah, blah? And I was like, I didn't have any of that. And he's like, well, what did you do? I said... I phoned Frank, <laughs> and he's like, well, why? I was like, well, what else would you do? I couldn't. It was literally a conversation where I, we were talking at complete cross-purposes. He had assumed that we'd have this strategy and investment case and business plan, and it was literally a 50p phone call to Frank, and, and the rest is history. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But actually... <laughs> <laughs> and we should stand up for Frank, and for Kern stand as well, for, for all the work that they did. So. Yeah, Kern. <laughs> And I should just take it one step further, because as we know, that work then continued, uh, and colleagues here from Norway and from the Gates Foundation and others continued that work, also then working with Bayer, and Aneta is here somewhere as well, 
uh, and we then got the Jadel Access Program, and then we then uh, Merck came back for a second go uh, and joined that uh, impl implant access program and the savings now generated are going to be in the order of hundreds of millions of dollars and, and when the announcement was made I did tease Monica uh, and said you'd got a great price reduction but you did have the, the Gates Foundation balance sheet to back you up and we just did it on the basis of a phone call. So <laughs> <laughs> Actually <coughs> speaking of, of Katya because we were both there together in, in the Netherlands when, when Merck opened its new production line and I was asked to say a few words at the beginning of a, a, a panel session that was held there. And one of the things I said was that this was a deal that only <coughs> amateurs could have made. Absolutely. Uh, we had no lawyers, we had no accountants, we had nothing, just sort of talking. Yeah. And I think that opens up the whole question. I mean, the coalition has grown. We're bigger now than we were before, we have more money. Do we still have that flexibility? Do we still, I mean, we talk about having the flexibility, and this in many ways is one big family, but do we, in today's environment, given the growth that we've seen, do we have that flexibility to still do something like that, in your view? I think we do. I mean, I think there are risks to us now, because in those days, we were really not that well known. And I, and I teased Jagdish at the time that he uh, recruited us. And you've given us all names today. Uh, and I think the name that we should give Jagdish is he was very much the kingmaker. Um, but I remember at the time that he interviewed me for the role, um, and, he, and he set out the criteria for what he was looking for in a chair, but I think the reason that he came to me was that I was at Diffid and I had a checkbook. It was nothing to do with whether I had any skills or experience. It was very much because he thought I had access to money. Um, but I think in those days, we, we were really not that well known. And in fact, when I was interviewed for the role, I had to Google what the coalition was because I'd never actually heard of it. Um, so these days, we're, we're much more known. And, and as we know, I mean, 350 people here, thousands of people around the world whose organizations are part of the coalition. So we have a responsibility now um, to do good with the money that we have, to make better use of the money that we have. And we have a commitment to the clients that we seek to serve to make sure that we do that well. But I still think that the coalition has that family feel. It really is a family where anybody in this room can make a suggestion, have an idea, and there are people around the room who can make it happen. I mean, I was talking last night um, to Roy Jacobstein, and he made reference to the fact that three years ago at the coalition meeting in Uganda, he did a presentation on uh, long-acting and permanent methods, which at the time were not on the agenda. And three years on, we have a whole, parallel, uh, a whole panel session with key actors talking about how to increase access to LARCs. So I think the coalition really does offer that space where anybody here can make a suggestion, identify a problem, and find people around the table who can help them solve it. Good, good, thanks. So, your term ended. You left some very big shoes to fill, and then we put Jagdish on the search. <laughs> Jagdish, what were you looking for? John, you are making me feel like a grandfather right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> since I'm a grandfather, let me, um, let me also remember right now to Steve Sinding, uh, who was then uh, IPPF Director General, who really supported the movement and where we are right now. Now, coming back to the, the competencies of the chair, you heard Dr. Bickman at the time when we had a financial uh, problem globally on the supplies and family planning, gag rule and all that. He, he had a banking and financing expertise. That's what I probably, I said private sector. Uh, in that sense that you were working like a financing and banking and understanding how money works. But the situation changed after uh, Julia was about to leave. We were talking MDG5, we were talking broader sexual reproductive health, universal access um, of reproductive health, and bringing so many, and the whole, uh, our mandate is, it, uh, there are so many actors, there are so many stakeholders who are coming in the world where we need to bring a very <coughs> clear message and uh, ground our issues together so that the world will take it on and say that this is most important thing. In given the broader thing, and not peripheral uh, issues and going around. So we wanted a chair that can take the message very grounded within the broader MDG5 goal and also looking at the how family planning and commodity issue can be really mainstreamed and very strong advocate who can take the message forward. And you know what? We found Marlin there. <laughs> and Marlin is the chair then. Good. 
I mean, going further on this issue of flexibility and knowing what you know about the coalition, you've been chair for, for one year now. Uh, I think the coalition obviously is a very different kind of organization than many you've worked in in the past. I guess it's different from being in, in the executive branch of government. It's different from the structures in the World Bank right now. What do you think about the, 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 the way we can use flexibility and the way sort of the informality, the structured informality we talked about can play an important role in the kinds of work that we do? Thank, uh, thanks, John. And uh, listening to all my predecessors and what have be, has been said, I think I'm just as most of you very impressed and it is indeed stepping in big shoes. Uh, I, now I know why you reached out to me, Chagdish. <laughs> I, I definitely not for the checkbook at WHO. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thinking about flexibility and so I have been working in, in the past in different constituencies with more structure and less flexibility. Coming from academics, um, clinical work, NGO sector, and then I made the move some seven years ago to politics. And I ran for the election. I was elected as a senator in the parliament, which is again a complete different mm -hmm. constituency and made me understand how big the walls are between all the different silos. Researchers do research to improve the lives, but policymakers don't use the results, and vice versa. Policymakers need data, but they don't, we talk different languages. So this was a very kind of walking on X, trying to bridge the gap between good practices, research into policies and politics, which was a very good preparation to go to WHO. Because in the UN, it's also about politics on a global scale. And bringing these different constituencies together requires indeed flexibility, innovation, because also in the UN, we are very much, you have to learn the UN language. And what I see in the coalition, and I think we saw it also in the HIV world, where in my experience, for the first time, we had initially a conference of scientists, then of epidemiologists, demographers, <coughs> then the civil society, then and the UN, and the governments, and the activists. But still, and it has grown over the years, but still working very much in silos. And what I see here, what has impressed me in my very limited just one year in the coalition that here there is this flexibility. Also in this meeting, people talk, we, we don't see a table with activists and a table private sector and a table um, yeah. government, but you know, everyone is kind of working around the same topic. And I think that's what we, this shift of par in paradigm, going to realize that we need each other. And we cannot, of course, we all have our different constituencies where we work and where we are used to work, but we, used, we, we have to create these bridges. And that's what the coalition is doing. And I think should be doing even more, reaching also out to, to politics, to governments, mm -hmm. to act, activists, activists are here, mm -hmm. but to even build this kind of having more building blocks to reach to this flexibility, entrepreneurship, a different way of looking at things. And that's, I think, how we can then support our, our partners. One of the things that um, sort of we've been doing lately within the coalition, uh, both in preparation for this panel, but also in preparation for the publication we mentioned earlier on, the sea turtles, why has the coalition been able to survive? is uh, my colleague Hannah Pandian, uh, who heads up our communications team, uh, along with our uh, brilliant graphics um, person standing there with the camera, Lucian, <laughs> <laughs> um, is that we've been interviewing each of, the, each of the chairs to ask them about their favorite memories, 
Uh, Julia mentioned coining the phrase power of partnership. It was one of her favorite members, the memories of being uh, uh, in the chair's position within the coalition. Elizabeth, do you have any favorite memories? Is there one particular memory that you can look back on that, that you think with fondness despite the, the difficult birth? Oh, I can think of several, but I'll okay. just share one. <laughs> Um, you know, we all work in bureaucracies, and procurement kept coming up as an issue. And uh, they, of course, there's limited capacity to do the tendering, even when there is a line, uh, budget line item to buy contraceptives. And I was working at the World Bank, but we could not use the UN to help countries to use World Bank money to procure contraceptives. And to do that, we had to change and get a waiver from the president of the World Bank. And it was a long process, but with the support of the coalition, and I had to learn about all the articles of agreement with the World Bank to see where loopholes might be. And uh, the lawyers at first had said, no go. But in the end, we did it. And we actually, not only did we get a waiver for yeah. UNFPA, we also get a waiver, an umbrella waiver for UNICEF, that they could also buy uh, maternal and child health um, uh, products. For me, that was a defining moment because if there is will, there is always a way. And through the coalition, I think you have proved this with the many things and examples that um, uh, Julia has talked about. You talked about Frank. My phone calls were always to Thoraya. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, you still sit on, on our board now with the hat of, of IPPF, so you're still very much up to date with and involved in decisions that are taking place within the, the context of the executive committee. Margaret and, and uh, Wolfgang, not so much because you have gone on into different lives and but I think you still, I hope so, if not, give me the email address, uh, still get our supply insider. So I think you can still follow the changes and developments that are taking place. But you have that kind of distance. And seeing where we are now, seeing the world that's changing, what do you see as being the possibilities, the, the risks, the threats, the challenges we face in being relevant in this new environment? Wolfgang, why don't I start with you? Um, what do you think on that? Yeah, I think uh, I have to congratulate the evolution the coalition has taken to grow into a real international forum uh, willing to move ideas and to implement them. And as we have learned, this is possible only if different sources cooperate, like uh, different UN family organizations who didn't use to speak too much to each other. Uh, we've heard of the World Bank and UNFPA, but there were others, uh, and the same to this whole context here. Now, if we uh, want to look into the future, uh, I think uh, the coalition should maintain this role to weave uh, strings between uh, actors and also to implement this in national policy making and international policy making. Second, I think uh, the coalition has to make sure uh, that a situation where budget gaps exist does not re-emerge in a new environment of uh, development finance we are embarking on. And um, particularly, there is a certain uh, danger that the small field of reproductive health uh, sinks into financing for global health. Uh, so it has to maintain its specific specificity. Um, and uh, the link to that is also the issue of efficiency and the uh, reproductive mix. Uh, the public health uh, organizations, they are so much uh, discussing <coughs> about uh, one only uh, efficient product, which is also cheap. 
but we know in the reproductive health we have to have the variety of the reproductive mix and as we have seen uh, we didn't talk so much about long-acting methods in the past we are now talking about them so the reproductive mix itself is also changing and developing so if the coalition could maintain uh, these issues for the future and would act on them both on the international level but also in the countries on the domestic level, I think that would be a perfect uh, evolution. Okay. Marlene, you're at the, at the helm of the ship right now, looking into a future. Um, what do you think is our, our commitment, our, future, our commitment to partners and our, our future way ahead? What, what should we be thinking about as we look to the future? Looking to the future, I think there are some challenges. We have, uh, we all know ICPD 1994. We know that a lot of people out there don't embrace sexual and reproductive health and rights. So I think one of the challenges, and there the coalition can really play an important role, is to make sure that a family planning is on the agenda on its own right, because. You know, we have, we have seen uh, like 18 to 20 years of horrendous neglect of family planning. Family planning was kind of buried in sexual and reproductive health and it's only thanks to the, well, thanks to many efforts, but let's say with the FP 2020 movement that family planning again has come higher on the agenda. But we have to make sure that in the post-2015 um, world that family planning on will, will be a major topic because with the 17 targets and all, everything what is going on now, as it was said already by many here in the panel, there is a risk mm -hmm. that family planning will kind of go to bullet point number 25 and will not appear high on the agenda. And I think we as, as this coalition, the largest coalition of reproductive health constituencies should really be very powerful and be an advocate from different angles, whether we talk now from the UN, the private, bilaterals, foundations, NGOs, civil society, doesn't matter, but that all of us take it as one major uh, point on our agenda to have in the post-2015 to have family planning high on the agenda. Supplies, but also quality, I mean, it all goes together. And that, I think, is a, a major challenge, but we can do it. I'm sure that we can do it. And just to end, one of my favorite proverbs that I heard many, many countries in, in, in Africa is, it takes two to make a child, but a village to raise a child. And I think family planning is our child, and we are that village. So we really have to focus on that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that, that we're coming up to uh, uh, the hour uh, when we're supposed to start bringing things to close, but I do want to take advantage of, of the last few minutes. Um, as I've mentioned uh, during the discussions yesterday, our secretariat has grown uh, dramatically. Uh, we've doubled in size, uh, which means that, that probably half the members of the secretariat really don't have the long historical institutional knowledge that we have here today. And so we've instituted within the, the coalition these sessions that we have sometimes at the end of staff meetings or on other occasions, all you've ever wanted to know about the coalition but were afraid to ask. Uh, and I'd like to do that now, although unfortunately you only have a few minutes left to be able to do that. But I'd like to give the, the audience here a chance to ask some questions of the chairs that still may be out there. This has been a, a fairly organized discussion, at least in terms of the questions, but I'd like the, uh, the audience to really get a chance to, to pose their questions. Any hands? Jotham. Microphone. <coughs> okay. Hi, I have a quick question okay. of why no. was it decided that the Secretariat is located in Brussels? Ah. Okay, um, take a row? Elizabeth, you, the, well, I, <laughs> Elizabeth or Margaret, Elizabeth, you were, you were there at the time, that was before my time, why was that? Okay, so one of the principles we had agreed to was neutrality, 
And uh, we had several um, donor countries represented on the executive committee, but Brussels is actually the um, center or the seat of the European Commission. And it seemed like a very neutral place um, to have the uh, secretariat placed there. It was quite central. And it kind of removed you from just being managed by mm. one, you know, or the control or being taken over by mm -hmm. any of the other donors. Yeah. And we also had anticipated that actually um, this would give us an opportunity to build relationships with the um, EU yeah. and with see if we could get their money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. And they did sit <laughs> on our, well, but they also did sit on our board yeah. for yeah. a number well, of years. Yes, they were there at the yeah. beginning. And because it's a beautiful city. <laughs> and a great <laughs> country. Very nice yeah. With country. three queens and two kings. Nice food. And, yeah. 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 <laughs> what and little did we know Marlene would appear. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Marlene, Senator, Marlene, <laughs> Senator Temmerman. Yeah. Uh, Jotham, you've got your mic. Yeah. Thank you, John. And uh, just say that uh, one, uh, I just, we should also recognize uh, John Wolle, who also was very, very instrumental in being with us at the very beginning uh, <laughs> from uh, the DFID. Uh, my point that really made me stand up is the fact that I don't want to take it from our current chair, Marine, and, and I think we are almost getting there, but I just want to underscore this, this message. <clears throat> this very morning, uh, those of you who may have watched BBC or other news channels, you have heard about the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, and uh, in that I, I heard that doctors, I am a doctor myself so I can uh, talk about this, Doctors were turning away women from coming to access services because they feared the women had Ebola. So my, my message is this. If, you, if doctors who saw that they would protect and give services to all people, they are now turning away women. And I know I'm also sitting next to the president of Women Deliver who cares so much about women delivering. If we get this problem because of epidemics like Ebola and others which we don't know about, there is a need for us as leaders in reproductive health to make sure we continue also to play a leadership role, engage leaders to make sure that uh, epidemics like Ebola and others that may come do not jeopardize the things that we ourselves are thinking about. Because as we talk about now, even if there are budgets for budget lines for reproductive health services, if I'm the Minister of Health of Uganda and there is an epidemic of uh, Ebola, obviously reproductive health will suffer. And so in order for us to protect what we care so much about, we also need to speak out about the need to nip epidemics like Ebola in the bud before they cause problems. Uh, that is all I just wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joffrey. I think we have probably enough time for uh, just one quick question. That's good. Yeah. Could. Me? No, sorry. Kuhn? That's right. Please stand. It's, okay, sorry. It's a quick question to uh, Julia and Margaret. Um, I, I would like to, to hear a little bit more how the DFID and the, the Dutch Ministry of, of uh, Foreign Affairs benefited from uh, the coalition. Okay, shall I start? Um, well, we, we benefited in a sense that we realized that good partners work together. And it took us a while to really get to that stage. Now you're at the stage, and that's something that you should be very proud of, is that you are great partners. Great, not good. I mean, you're complementing each other. And you're actually getting better value together for the limited money for development and for reproductive health supplies, which there is. Um, so, so this, I would say, is an important note as far as you know, the ministry is concerned. Um, personally, what I learned is that you should never underestimate the power of a small group of committed individuals to change the world. I mean, look at what you are today. I mean, that's amazing. Great. Thank you. Well, I would echo that. And Margaret's just quoted it. Actually, another Margaret is the Margaret Mead quote was the power yes. of a few people. Yes. It's a fabulous quote. And in fact, I think it's on the side of the Gates Foundation building. Yeah. I mean, for me and for DFID, I think it, uh, the work that the coalition was doing and the work that, uh, that we observed and participated in, and I think back to things like the hand-to-hand -hand campaign, 
and the Implant Access Initiative gave DFID ministers the confidence to initiate the London Summit on Family Planning because we had seen the power of partnership. We'd seen that there were committed people around the world who would come together with all their energies, with all their ideas, with all their knowledge and with their commitments to make something that was bigger than any one of us could do together. And I used the example of what we'd achieved as a coalition, both through Hand to Hand and through the Implant on Access initiative to make the case to Secretary Mitchell that the London Summit was something that we could do. So I think, and as we look at FP2020, a lot of the structures that exist in FP2020 are modelled on the Secretariat with the reference group and the working groups. So I think the coalition has punched well above its weight in terms of not only what we've done as a coalition, but how we've influenced uh, much bigger global processes. It also brought us the global programme of UNFPA that yeah, we worked exactly. together on very, yeah. you know, consistently and yeah thank you Margaret for talking about global program absolutely <laughs> yeah. well i see unfortunately the hour is coming to a close and i i you know obviously and i'm speaking to to both sides here we really invited you here to 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 benefit from your memories and also to share our our milestone birthday uh, but we also invited you here to thank you for your courage for your vision and commitment and staying power. Without you, we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be what we are today, we wouldn't be looking, future, looking to a, a, a future decade ahead. And so I'd like everyone to please stand up and give a hand for these fabulous people who have brought us to where we are. <laughs>